Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight uh, here at City of Refuge for our Wednesday night uh, Bible study. Um, it's good to have you guys join us um, tonight as we um, start in Revelation chapter 7. Um, for those that um, haven't been following along with us, um, we've been studying the book of Revelation for about a year. We've made it through the first six chapters. Um, I tend to uh, not just go verse by verse, but fairly slow uh, verse by verse. So who knows how long Revelation will ultimately take us. Um, but we start Revelation chapter 7 tonight. So um, thank you for joining us. Would love to have you um, join us. If you have questions or comments, um, please feel free to leave them um, there, to just type them in there. Melissa's here off camera. Um, she'll stop me along the way if there are questions um, to answer or comments that need um, attention. And we'll just keep moving our way through. As I've shared week after week, I really do believe that Bible study is, is, is meant for interaction. It's meant to talk among each other, to ask questions, to give insight, to share experience, um, and to really let God speak not just through one person to a group, but to through each person in a group. And so we don't really have that dynamic um, here with Facebook Live. So next Wednesday night, we'll have a Zoom discussion. So basically, I'll teach sort of lecture style tonight, and then next Wednesday night, we'll have a Zoom discussion where we can all sit and talk about it. Um, with the changes that have been made, it won't be long till we can be back together again, um, but for um, at least the next couple of weeks, we'll keep doing it this way. So tonight, we'll be reading Revelation chapter 7. We'll read verses 1 through 8. Um, why don't we start with a word of prayer? And then um, I'll read the passage. Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight for your word. Thank you that it is so important to you that we know your heart, that we know your character, and that we know your will. That you moved by your spirit men to write down your heart so that those words could be applied to our hearts. And so tonight, God, I ask that the same way that the Holy Spirit anointed men to write these words, that they would anoint, that he would anoint us to hear them, to understand them, to apply them, to discuss them, but more than anything else, to obey them. Let your word find a resting place in our hearts, a place where it would settle in and bear fruit through our lives, fruit for the glory of God and fruit for the redemption of the world that we live in. And so, Lord Jesus, I just pray tonight that you would order our steps, that you would fill our mouths, that you would open our ears and our hearts and our minds to you and to you alone. Be blessed. Be pleased. And I just pray even as I teach, Lord, let your spirit lead my thoughts and lead my words. Don't let anything come out of my mouth that isn't from your heart. And I just pray that we would leave this place tonight more confident of you and more committed to obeying you than ever before. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So Revelation chapter 7, I'm going to read verses 1 through 8. I'm reading in the New King James Version. John writes, After these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed. One hundred and forty-four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. Of the tribe of Judah, twelve thousand were sealed. Of the tribe of Reuben, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Gad, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Asher, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Simeon, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Levi, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Issachar, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Zebulon, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Joseph, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000 were sealed. So, Revelation chapter 6 ends with the opening of the sixth seal. There was a cosmic disturbance then that I believe led to the return of Jesus because uh, the, the entire world runs to rocks and caves to try to hide from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. 
it's my belief and my opinion that the world cannot run from, they can't know who it is hiding from unless they had seen him. The world has already rejected the lamb, so how do they know that the wrath of the lamb has come unless they've seen him in his coming? But chapter 6 ends with a question asked by those hiding from wrath. They say, for the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Chapter 7 is often thought of as an interlude between the opening of the sixth and the seventh seal, or as a parenthetical passage. But let me ask this tonight as we start. What if chapter 7 is actually the answer to the question that ends chapter 6? What if chapter 6 ends with those that are bound for destruction, bound for judgment, crying out, who is able to stand? And what if in his great mercy, chapter 7, is God answering that question? See, these visions that John had were all given from God. And I think that this is a very important point for us. John was not simply seeing the future. He was being given visions from God. They were just like Paul's visions of heaven, Peter's visions of food, Joseph's visions of leadership, and Pharaoh's dreams of famine and plenty. See, Revelation was not just a glimpse into the future. It was a vision that would prepare for the future, that would teach truth, and that would exalt and glorify Jesus. Just using the other, some of the other visions in Scripture as our guide. Paul's visions of heaven taught him the gospel, and they prepared him for his life of missions and suffering. Peter's vision of food actually had nothing to do with food at all. Peter's vision of food is not why you and I as Gentiles don't have to eat kosher. We don't have to eat kosher because the scriptures tell us if you were a Gentile, stay a Gentile. But it also says if you were a Jew, stay a Jew. Peter's vision was of food, but it had nothing to do with food. It was God using food, something that Peter would understand, to reveal that salvation was for all of humanity. If you think back to the book of Acts, what, what are we told about Peter right before that vision? It says that he was weary and he was hungry. So why wouldn't God speak to his place of need, speak to where he was, because that's what God does. And so that vision, we have lost the purpose of it if we think it has something to do with food. Food is the symbol for the, the fact that all men are clean, that God desires salvation for all. Joseph's dreams of leadership were to give him hope and courage during slavery and imprisonment. Again, we think about God and his kindness. God knew what was going to happen in Joseph's life. In fact, at the end of his life, he even said God intended these things. So that means God knew how he was going to lead Joseph's life. And so before he was sold into slavery, before he was falsely imprisoned, before he was forgotten in prison, God had already given him dreams that he could hold on to that would help lead him, prepare him, and guide him when his life didn't go to exactly where he expected it to go. And then there were Pharaoh's dreams. When they were, where they were given to Pharaoh so that Joseph in his leadership position, so that, so that he would put Joseph in his leadership position so that Israel could be led to Egypt, the furnace that would form them from a family into a nation. So understanding the way God uses visions throughout Scripture is the same way we have to go about studying Revelation. The visions of Revelation are to prepare the church, not just for the moment of Jesus' return, but for our calling to trust in God's sovereignty and to glorify Jesus rightly in every age, in every nation, and in the midst of every turmoil. It's not about knowing the timing of the events. It's about knowing, trusting, and declaring God's character. I share all of this because it means that the question at the end of chapter 6 was not just something that John heard, it was what God wanted him to hear. Because remember, this is revelation. So that means it's God revealing things to John so that John can write them for us. And so John didn't just see the, 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 the turmoil. He didn't just see the stars fall from the sky or the asteroid, as some people believe that it is. He didn't just see the horsemen. He didn't just see these events. He saw what God wanted him to see. And one of the key things that God wanted John to see was to see the world crying out, who can stand? 
God wanted the question to be asked. He wanted the question to be heard so that the answer could be revealed. And so as we move into Revelation 7, I think it's really important that we understand a question that God wanted us to hear. God is now making sure we see the answer. None of this is by chance. And none of this, this is just playing history, playing on a screen, or the future playing on a screen for us to watch and see how it happens. It's all God's sovereignty. It's all God's heart. It's all God's mind making sure we see him for who he is. Because if we know who God is, what happens in time doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. But the reality is, if we don't know who God is, what happens in time also doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. The key is knowing God's heart and being confident in his character. So let's move into chapter 7, verse 1. John writes, After these things I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on any tree. So, after these things, in the Greek, is metatalto. It's the combination of words that doesn't simply mean, like, then. It's, it's not just the next thing. It is a significant transition. Again, it's not just like, and then... There's a sh the, the reality is, after these things means there's a shift, there's a change. There is something that is about to be different than the last thing. And so it's my opinion that in this, what we're seeing is a new vision. That there is a shift that's happening in vision. That this isn't the next thing that happens. This is the next thing God reveals. And there is a tremendous difference. As we read Revelation, we have to be careful that we're not so set on this being, as I talked about two weeks ago, a linear timeline where everything is chronological. And we go that this opens, then this opens, then this opens, and this happens, then this happens. But for us to see, God wants us to know this. And then God wants us to know this, and that God is connecting each one of those things together for a purpose that is all his own. And so I believe that this is quite possibly, if not probably, the beginning of another vision. That's one of the things that I think needs to be remembered. The revelation of Jesus Christ is not one long vision. It is a series of visions, and it is at the, even at times visions within visions. And each detail of the vision is ordered by God and it has purpose. That's why we can't read Revelation like we're reading history. We can't even read it as if we're reading just literal prophecy, assuming that the events unfold in the order and manner in which they are written. There is a lot of figurative language in Revelation. But it's not just Revelation. Those of you who have, been, who have studied and spent time reading the Old Testament prophets, there is figurative language in Ezekiel and Daniel and Isaiah and Jeremiah and Zechariah and on and on and on. Prophetic language foretells actual events, but it is often, but it often and largely does it with figurative language. Let's go back to the very first prophecy that's written in the scripture. Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. As God is speaking judgment, as he's speaking punishment and judgment to Adam and Eve and to the serpent and even to the ground of the earth. He tells the serpent that, that the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent, but that the serpent will wound the heel of the, heel of the woman's seed. Isn't that figurative language? That's not what literally happened. Jesus didn't come and step on a snake's head, he did, but he came and he crushed Satan's head with his death and with his resurrection because he won back the dominion that Adam and Eve had given away and had given away in their sinfulness. And so what we see is prophecy is often figurative. It does tell a literal truth, but it tells it in a figurative way. And so I think that we would be really better off if we would allow the book of Revelation to teach us truth rather than to present us with, a, with, with the future. It is truth that, will be, that we need in the future, but it's not just, again, a timeline. It, there's much more depth to it. Prophetic language foretells actual events, but it often and largely does it with figurative language. So what we see in chapter 1 is there is a transition 
from people hiding in caves to a new vision, a new scene, a new message. John then saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth. So there's already a lot of figurative language here. First, we all know this. The earth is round. It doesn't have four corners. It's not flat and, it doesn't, and it's not a rectangle. So the four corners of the world of the earth are figurative. It's the four directions of the compass, north, south, east, and west, and they represent the entire world being covered. So anytime anything talks about the four corners of the earth, all it means is nothing is missing. The entirety of the earth is being covered. In prophetic scripture, the other thing that we find is that wind often represents judgment. Jeremiah chapter 49 verse 36, God speaking says, and I will bring and I will bring upon Elam the four winds from the four quarters of heaven, and I will scatter them to all those winds, and there shall be no nation to which those driven out of Elam shall not come. One thing that's also important for us to remember, when the scriptures speak of heaven, more often than not, it's talking about the sky and the atmosphere. So when in Jeremiah 4.36, when God says that he's going to scatter Elam to the four quarters of heaven, he's not talking about the place where he resides or the place where we think of going after we die. He's talking about throughout all of the world, throughout all of our atmosphere, throughout all of the earth. Daniel chapter 7 verse 2, Daniel writes, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. The great sea is this symbol of the earth. It's the symbol of the nations of the earth. And so what Daniel sees is God stirring up the nations in preparation for the tribulation that leads the way to the return of Christ. Even in Ezekiel chapter 5, verse 12, Ezekiel writes, A third part of you shall die of pestilence and be consumed with famine in your midst. A third part shall fall by the sword all around you, and a third part I will scatter to all the winds and will unsheath the sword after them. The four winds represent the judgment of God. But here's where it gets interesting. Wind also represents the presence of God. We have been so conditioned to fear judgment, to view it from a negative perspective, but judgment is not the same as wrath, although wrath comes because of judgment. Judgment, for most of us, is this negative idea. We even say, right, don't, don't judge me. And we quote Matthew 7, judge not that you be not judged. And so we think of judgment as this negative thing. It's when punishment comes. It's when discipline comes. It's when we are crushed for our wrongdoings. But judgment in its truest sense is when truth is revealed. There is a judgment when a winner is chosen. There is a judgment when a competition ends. There is a judgment at the end of everything that involves finding out which one, what, what the outcome of it is going to be. So the wind of judgment is only fearful to those that don't know the character of the judge or those who have not confessed the reality of their condition because that's what everything always comes down to, the character of God and the condition of man. And so God is constantly revealing to our hearts who he is in his holiness and who we are in our unholy condition so that he can win us, so that he can change us, redeem and reconcile and restore us. So the same wind that blows in the judgment of Revelation blew in the fulfillment of the promise at Pentecost. The same wind that punishes the wicked caught up Elijah for his reward. Wind represents God's presence and God's judgment because they are one and the same. There can't be judgment without presence. And so constantly what God is doing is calling us to prepare ourselves for his presence so that he will not have, so that he will not have to give wrath when it is time for judgment. At judgment, the wicked will perish and the righteous will be redeemed. Those who believe in Jesus as the Messiah will be seated at his table and those who reject him will be cast outside of his kingdom. I don't want to get too far off track here, but if God's judgment and God's present are, presence are both signified by wind, and we already know that the Hebrew word for both breath and wind are ruach, that means that when God breathed into humanity, he was making a judgment. 
He was settling something. Where does man come from? Where will man go? Who created him? But also, what was he created to be? See, not only was man made in God's image when he molded Adam from clay, but God then blew his image into man. So that means we don't just look like God. God has put a part of himself into us. As humanity, we are in this place where God has already judged us, not as wicked or righteous, but as belonging to him, being desired by him, being wanted by him. This is why love for one another is so important. And I think it's why John in 1 John 4, 20 said so emphatically that you cannot hate your brother whom you can see and think you can love God whom you can't see. Because not only is every human being made in God's image, but God is in some manner in every human being. He breathed his presence into each of us. There was no life until God breathed into Adam. So the breath, we know that the life is in the blood, mm. but the, bl the breath is the beginning of life. Mm. The wrath of judgment comes when God's presence is rejected or denied. Mm. But judgment and presence are always tied to each other. In our next text, there are, excuse me, in our text, there are four angels. And these four angels are not just standing at the four corners of the earth holding the four winds. It says that they are holding the winds back. So this means that they are by God's command holding back the wrath of God's judgment. Once more what we get to see is this picture of God's sovereignty. Everything is in God's hands. Judgment is poured out and held back by God's command. Do you see God's character yet again? That the angels were given the wind by God, but then God at the same time tells them, not yet, hold it back. So even though God says it's time for judgment because he's the father of time, he can delay time. He can hold it back for us. He, as we saw in Matthew 24, he ends the tribulation soon, early, so that all flesh won't be destroyed. But here we see that even though he said it's time for judgment he holds the judgment back because again we get to see his character we again get to see God's heart and we get to see his desire as Jesus taught again in Matthew chapter 24 tribulation begins and ends by God's by God's decree by the actions of God's character everything we read in Revelation is by God and that's hard for us because it's not the way that we've generally read Re Revelation. In fact, I regularly, especially in what we are facing right now between the pandemic and the racial unrest and the factions that are fighting against each other and the things that God is exposing and the sin that, is being, that has been hidden that's now being uncovered, all this that's happening in our own culture. I read often people talking about, this is the book of Revelation unfolding. This is the book of Revelation unfolding. That's fine as long as we understand this is the work of God. That this is what God does. Remember, when the horsemen are released, it's because Jesus gave them authority. Here we see the four angels with the four winds and the power to harm. And yet it's God who gave them the wind and it's God who holds the wind back. So the question for us should never be, what is Satan doing? But where is God working? Because God does not react to Satan. Satan reacts to God. God, Jesus said in John chapter... Uh, John chapter 5, he said, my father is always at work and I too am working. So that means Satan is trying to catch up with God. God in no means is trying to catch up with Satan. So even when we read about tribulation, about trials, about judgment, about wrath, know this in your heart and in your mind. This is by God's hand, which means if we trust his character, it is one more thing that we can apply to Romans 8, 28 and 29. For we know this, all things work together for good for those who love God and are called together according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined that they might be conformed to the image of his son. So that means even what we're seeing here, it's not just for salvation. It is for the conforming to the image of Jesus. Because no matter where we stand, and we are allowed to differ, but no matter where we stand on when the church exits, 
Here's what we have to under know. There will be people saved during the course of the Great Tribulation. And when they are saved, the persecution that comes upon them is not simply the enemy trying to destroy them. It is also all things working together for good that they would become like Jesus. Which for me is why, and I, and I have my own belief, and you guys get to hear it peppered in, and you'll hear more of it as we go, but for me it's why the timing of the rapture might be the least important part of what's taught in the book of Revelation. Because the reality is, if we know that all things are working together for good, if we are raptured before the tribulation, it is for good. If we are left for half the tribulation, it is for good. If we are called to endure the entirety of the tribulation, it is for good. And the good will always be that we are conformed to the image of the Son. And so we are allowed to have different interpretations. We are allowed to read it different, to feel differently about when. But the what, mm. the why, and the who, yeah. those the scriptures make very clear for us. And so let's not make this so much about timing that we miss the purpose. And the purpose is always God's character. And so what we get to see in the end of, chap of chapter 7 verse 1 is the same God who put authority in their hands to harm holds authority back. Because he's patient and he's kind. Let's read verses 2 and 3 together. It says, Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. So, at the beginning of the chapter, we have four angels. The beginning of this vision, we have four angels given authority to release judgment. But then there's another angel that enters. Another angel that enters the scene, and he is carrying the seal of the living God. And he ascends and he cries for judgment to be withheld or delayed. As I've been studying this the last few weeks, there is just this... Um, you guys know, those of you who read your scripture often, that study you often, there are these moments where you read something and it connects to something else and, um, and it just sort of um, excites you. It, uh, I, I can't think of a better word right now, but this is just a passage that has really been sparking and reminding me just of God's character and new depths and in new ways for me. Because as I was reading this, I, and I'm trying to picture it because it was a vision, it was a picture. And there's this moment where there's four angels ready to pour out wrath and to pour out judgment. And then in this, in this sudden moment, there is a fifth angel who ascends. That means he comes up and he comes up and he cries out to them to delay don't do it. I know it's been given to you, but it's no longer time. And I just, my heart and my mind immediately went to James 2.13. And I just, just thought, this is what it means. This is what it looks like when mercy triumphs over judgment. Wow. This is actually a picture of it, a literal picture of judgment is prepared, but mercy is given the victory. Mercy is allowed to exist where judgment deserves. Even though God says it's time, it's God saying, I'm willing to delay. See, mercy triumphing over judgment does not remove the judgment. And it doesn't just blindly pardon, but it extends mm. mercy. It offers grace. Mm. It provides another opportunity for repentance, for forgiveness, and for transformation. So it's not just God saying, don't worry about it. It's God saying, Give them one more call, one more opportunity. Mm. Give them yet one more chance. Give them one more opportunity. And I really believe that as we pray for unsaved loved ones and as we pray for our own community, what we should be praying is not for pardon, but for one more opportunity. Yeah. Praying for judgment yeah. to be delayed, for mercy to be extended. Praying for God to just be a little more patient and a little more long-suffering, that he would show himself yet again, that he would give another opportunity for a hard heart to be softened, for a stiff neck to be loosened, for a... For, for for someone to give up their wounds and to receive the balm of his healing. Mm. Once again, we get to see the patience of God. Now, remember this, our main purpose in all of Scripture, the reason we read Scripture is to see God's character. 
that is my belief. That is what I teach. It is what I will stand on. Are there things we, are there blessings? Are there devotional th moments? Is there prophetic uh, revelation of the future? Absolutely. None of it matters unless we're learning the character of God. Because all of it falls short without our understanding of God's character. Our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. That's his character. And so if we don't know the character of God, we will, we will easily sway with every wind of doctrine. And every circumstance of life will shake us and change us. But when we know who God is and what God is like... We have this bottom that we can't fall past. And I believe this with all of my heart. He's made his, his character clear. He is good and his love endures forever. Mm -hmm. And if we are willing to believe those two things, no matter what happens in my life, I am sure of this, God is good. And no matter what happens in this world, I am sure of this, God loves me. And so there is no way and nothing that can happen to take me lower than that point. Mm -hmm. And so all of scripture is teaching us, wanting us, calling out to us to know the character of God. So the question is, what do we see about God in this passage? Not about the timing, not even about the judgment, but what do we see about God's character? For me, it's this, even when he releases judgment, he has the heart and the power to delay it yet a little bit longer. Mm. Do you ever wonder, and I know that we read, all, a lot of us read this differently, and so some of us are reading it chronologically, and that's how we believe it happens. I, I don't particularly ascribe to that. I do believe there are things that are happening, but I also think that there are things that have been happening in the heavenly realm for, 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 for thousands of years. And they are unfolding. Rather than them being a, a, a moment in time, they are the unfolding of time. Do you ever wonder how long he's been holding back judgment? Hmm. You know, we say it sometimes. You know, we look around and say, wow, God is, is merciful. If he doesn't judge us now, if he doesn't judge us now, but just think about our history and start backpedaling and say, well, he didn't judge us then, mm -hmm. and he didn't judge us then. You know, he, 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 many people believe that, you know, abortion will be a cause of judgment. And if there's a cause, that, that's deserving to be one. But then we have to go back a little bit further and say, well, you know, slavery was, should have been a cause. And, and, and even the handling of the natives should have been a cause. And, and even the persecution of each other. We came here for religious freedom and then immediately the Puritans started persecuting those who were not per Puritans. So, and that's not to disparage our heritage. It's for us to understand that we haven't somehow slipped down a slope. We have been on our way since before we started. Yeah. And what has God done? He has held back judgment. That speaks to his character. It means that while he is the judge, he does not revel in judgment. Think of what he said to Ezekiel. I do not take pleasure in the death of the wicked. And yet we as humans do sometimes, right? Sometimes we hear about an execution and we think, well, you know what? He got what he deserved. The scriptures that God doesn't say that. The scriptures say he takes no pleasure. In the death of the wicked which you know what that means it means he continues to offer he can, it can, continues to extend that offends us sometimes right it offends us to think that the very the very centurion that stood at the cross of Jesus that might have been one of them that drove a nail or that gave the order for the spear to go in his side that when Jesus gave up the ghost that he sat down and said surely this was the son of God why does it that offend us but the idea that maybe he extended mercy Mercy to a slave owner or a slave trader or, or to Adolf Hitler or to Saddam Hussein or to Osama bin Laden or to this one or that one, that this is what God does. He holds back judgment and he extends mercy because that's who he is. And if that's what he's done for me, that's what he's done for the next person, it's what he's done for you, and it's what he does for all. It doesn't mean there won't be judgment. It means he gives more opportunities for mercy than we will ever realize, and clearly more than we could ever deserve. Remember what John heard being said to the martyrs of chapter 6? They cried out like you and I because in some way they still are human. They've yet to be, uh, you know, they, they've yet to get to that final glorified state. And so they cry out, how long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge, our and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth. So what they're saying is, how long until you take vengeance for those who killed us? And what was God's answer? 
rest a little while longer. Mm. He's telling them, you don't pick up vengeance because vengeance is mine and I say not yet. Mm. And thank God for how many times he has said not yet to the vengeance I've deserved. Mm. Thank God he said not yet when Saul of Tarsus deserved vengeance for the murders that he was a part of and for the havoc that he was re re wreaking, wreaking on the early church. Thank God for every murderer who's ever met Jesus in jail. Thank God for every, yeah. for every sinner that's ever been changed. Thank God for every one of us that when vengeance was deserved, God said, a little while longer. See, God's patience in the face of man's rebellion is the only reason that any of us have salvation. And if we're going to live for Jesus, we have to live like Jesus. And if we're going to live like Jesus, we have to long for salvation for the wicked rather than vengeance upon them. Because that's the heart of God. This takes us back to a passage we talk about very often. One of my favorite passages in all of Scripture, those of you who are with me every week know I've got probably three or four hundred of them. But this really is, you know, top ten list. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance. Verse 10 then continues, and it says, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. Peter tells us, and I love this, Peter tells us that God is willing to be considered slow by many so that he can offer mercy to more. Mm. See, that's what Peter is saying. He says, God is not slow concerning his promises as some count slowness. Aren't there so many things we do in life to make sure somebody doesn't think a certain thing about us? I wouldn't want them to think this. You know, we, 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 we do chores that we don't want to do. We, we take burdens we don't want to take. We do things and we dress ways and we say things and we go places. Why? Because I wouldn't want them to think this. And what Peter is saying, God is willing to be thought of as slow. Hmm. Just so that none would perish, but that all would come to repentance. So think about that the next time that someone judges you or even judges God to you about the timing of God. The next time someone says, well, where was God here? You know where he was? Patience. That's where he was. Where was God when this happened? He was giving patience. Or why didn't God do this at this time? He was giving patience. He is willing to be thought of as slow by some so that he can extend more, mer more mercy to others. The day of judgment but the day of judgment, the return of Christ, the outpouring of both wrath and redemption, Peter says they will come like a thief. That does not mean they will come quickly. That means they will come unexpectedly. Peter then finishes that, that thought process in chapter 3, verse 15, and he says, Consider the Lord's patience as salvation. If he were not patient, we could not be saved. That's the picture of the angel commanding the four other angels to hold back the wind. Even though they have been given authority to bring harm, their authority must be at all times yielded and submitted to God. Now, here's where I'm going to go on just a little bit of a tangent. If you were here, you could see Amanda smile because she likes when I go on <laughs> tangents. Hopefully it won't take us off course, but I actually think it appropriately fits with what we're talking about here tonight. This is why, because of what happens in this passage, this is why the idea that, quote unquote, the gifts are without repentance is most often used out of context, but not just out of context, it's used outside of God's character. Romans chapter 11, verse 29 is where we hear that. It says in the Berean literal Bible, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. So first of all, let's talk about context. Paul was writing to Gentile churches about Israel's ultimate salvation. He was expressing how we as Gentiles have been grafted into the vine of God's people that began with Israel, and he wants to make sure they don't get conceited. He also wants to make sure they don't gain religious prejudice. So he wants them to understand, and he even says to them that you are the wild root, you are the wild vine that has been grafted into the natural vine, and he says this, do not think that if God cut off the natural vine for your sake, that he will not also cut you off if you choose disobedience. 
Paul was teaching, he was expressing how we as Gentiles have been grafted in, but he's making it clear that Israel had by no means been excluded by God. The statement is not about gifts or callings. It's about God's character. This is not about someone who's really anointed, and even though they live in sin, they still carry around this anointing. God values character far more than he values giftings because he's the one who gives the gifts anyway. He doesn't need talent. He needs shepherds who have hearts after his own. That's why he moved Saul out and he moved David in. Because Saul thought of himself and David continued to think of God. But then we even see David in that place became prideful. He allowed himself to think like a king rather than keeping the heart of a shepherd. And it wreaked havoc upon his life, upon his family, upon his nation. Blood was spilled because of the pride that David chose. And yet what we see in the hands of God is, if we will turn to humility, he will always offer us grace. So this isn't about God finding people who can, he can use. It's him embracing people who are humble enough to be used however he wants to use them. The statement in, in Romans chapter 11 is about the character of God. It again does not mean that we have control over the gifts and the calling of God, as if once God gives them, they belong to us. Wasn't that the lack we saw in the character of Samson? Like Samson is this character that, you know, he's one of Israel's judges and God loves him and God uses him. And it doesn't make any sense because I don't see anything about Samson until his last moment that seemed like he understood the character or the heart of God. And yet we get to see God's patience yet again, where Samson was given a gift that he used for his own benefit. He used for his own amusement at times. He even used it for his own sin. And yet there was a moment where God never turned on him. But God allowed that gift to be removed. His head was shaved. His strength was lost. The presence of God departed. One of the saddest scriptures in all of the Bible mm -hmm. says that when Samson awoke after his head had been shaved, that the presence of God had departed and he knew it not. Because he thought he'd been given a gift that was in his control. He thought he'd been given an anointing by God to do what he wanted for God. See, that's how we use this verse so often. The gifts are irrevocable. The gifts are without repentance. It has nothing to do with what we think that it has to do or, or the way that we use it or even the way that we want to use it. Samson didn't get his gift back. Think of this. Samson didn't get his gift back until he offered the gift back to God. Because if it was just about Samson's hair growing out, he wouldn't have needed to pray in those last moments. He would have just pushed the pillars down and he would have had his moment of strength. But instead he asked God to restore what had been given away and God gave it back to him. Why? Because Samson finally put it where it belonged, mm -hmm. in the hands of God. Talents and gifts are not irrevocable. Mm. This is about who God is. This is about his covenant character. Again, it doesn't mean we have control over these things. They don't belong to us. It does not mean that the anointing is a primary thing. God does not judge us according to anointing, gifts, calling, purpose, or destiny. He judges us by the condition of our hearts, which means he judges us according to our character. The angels in Revelation 7 have the authority to cause harm. They even have the calling to bring judgment. But their authority and their calling were subject to God's character. Even though they'd been given authority, they knew that authority was still subject to God. Do we understand that? That the freedom we've been given is subject to the character of God. That the grace and the mercy, the gifts and the truth, the, the, the church body that we have been given, that we have been joined to as members of, the, of one body, do we understand that all of it is subject to God's character? He does with us what he desires. Mm. He doesn't give us stuff to do what we want Amen. or even what we think would be a good thing to do. That's why we have to hear from God or else we can't be used by God. Going back now to Revelation 7, there was a purpose in the delay. And it was not just God being sympathetic, it was God being patient. He was not simply holding back judgment, he was giving mercy to a defined group of people for a defined purpose in a defined time. 
The angel that halted the four angels said to them to hold back judgment until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. So it says that he had the seal of God. If you have start, ever started a corporation, you're given a seal, a, a, a seal for the corporation. That's all of the important documents. If they're not sealed, they're not authentic. If they're not sealed, they're not acceptable. If they're not sealed, they cannot be used for the incorporation. doesn't matter how many copies you have. Without that seal, it is not a representation of the corporation. So a seal was no different then, it, back then when it was written, except it would belong to the king or the governor or some person in authority. It was a mark used by that authority figure to prove two things most of all, authentication and ownership. So say someone came, Nehemiah returns to Jerusalem, right? He returns after being cupbearer of the king and he returns from Jerusalem to rebuild the walls. And he gets there and what did he have to take with him? Papers, letters, sealed by the king. Otherwise, he gets to Jerusalem and says, I'm here to build the walls. And they say, says who? Who gave you the authority? Why do we have to listen to you? Who gave you this great plan? And so it first shows authentic authentication, but then it also shows ownership. A seal is a proof that an item belongs to or is being sent by the king. This means there was still a number that God knew would repent. So God is holding back judgment because there is still a number. He's not just hopeful. God is knowledgeable. Mm. So it's not just God saying, you know what, let me give one more shot. He knows all things. Mm. And so he knows where our hearts are. Have you ever thought about this? That God withholds judgment until he knows no one else is coming? Mm. That he doesn't close the door of the ark until he knows no one else is coming in? And so when we start thinking about the number of the Gentiles, which we'll read in just a few minutes, it's not God saying, you have this long. It's God saying, I know who's willing. And so this is where predestination sort of starts to get woven into all of this. It's not in my belief that God created some for damnation, but God knows who will be damned. And so this is where God says there are hearts that are still willing, that are still, if there's pressure given, if there's judgment given, if there's this that I do, there are hearts still willing. And so I will wait until there are no more willing hearts. Mm. That's who God is. Yeah. He knows our hearts. And so we don't have to worry about people trying to fool God. People that are, you know, well, well, I'll just wait till the end. People that love sin so much that they think they'll wait for salvation at the end, their hearts will never receive salvation because they don't love Jesus. Salvation comes from love, not from a prayer, not from, a, 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 an, a, from an experience. And so God knows the condition of our hearts. He knows if we're willing. He knows if there's anything in us that is willing to be turned. And so what we see is that there is still a number that God knew would repent, that God knew would yield, and that God had called not only to salvation but to servanthood. I think it's really important that we see that this group of people are specifically called the servants of God. They would not just be saved, they would be used. But they first had to be sealed. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13 says that we were sealed with the Holy Spirit because we had believed in the gospel of Jesus. Mm -hmm. I think that Revelation 7 is showing us that God will withhold his wrath for those that he knows will surrender to Jesus, and they will then be sealed by the Holy Spirit. So the angel comes, and figuratively, he's carrying a seal to show what God's doing. But what is the seal of the New Testament? The Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So what we see is this is the Holy Spirit being present. We, sometimes people will say, where is the Spirit in Revelation? Just look for him. Because here he is. He is the one who seals our hearts in Christ Jesus. And so if there are some who are yet to be saved and the seal is carried by the angel, that means the Spirit is present saying there are still some whose hearts will be changed and whose hearts I will seal in Christ. So as we read this, and if you're willing to follow me, and you don't have to, but if you're willing to follow me in this and you are willing to see the seal of God as the Holy Spirit, then I've got to ask, do we believe that this is taking a literal seal or marking on the forehead? Is that how we see this actually happening? That, that, that revelation is so literal that there, at this end moment, there's going to be something that God does to literally put a marking on the foreheads of those who are the believers? Personally, I don't believe that. 
I believe this is figurative. I believe that the Holy Spirit is our seal. If the Holy Spirit was the seal up in Ephesians, why would he not be the seal in Revelation? I don't believe that another seal is needed. But then let me ask this, and this is going to be one of those sort of hit and run moments where I'm going to, I want to ask you something and then I'm going to move away from it. But I just want you to start thinking about it. If the seal on the foreheads of God's servants in chapter 7 is not literal, then why would the mark of the beast in chapter 13 be literal? See, God and Satan are fighting for possession of the same thing, our hearts. Mm -hmm. In chapter 7, God seals the hearts of his servants. In chapter 13, the beast makes the hearts of those who reject, uh, the beast marks the hearts of those who reject and refuse the lamb. We will talk about all of this at length when we get to chapter 13. But everything prior in chapter 13 to the mark of the beast being given is all about worship. It's those who bow down and those who worship the beast that he marks their right hand or their forehead. See, I believe that this will be about allegiance of heart. This will be about worship, not about a barcode or a microchip or a vaccination or any other physical at markings. But again, we'll get to that later. But I figured we're six chapters away. Why not plant it now and let you start thinking on it, reading on it, chewing on it, and then we can talk about it. Not argue over it, but we can talk about it when we get there. Back to chapter 7, verse 4, says, And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. So, for me personally, let's deal with this in, the order from, in order from least to most important. So we'll start with the number. The number is symbolic or figurative. It's not literal. I avoid numerology pretty much at all costs. Because for me, numerology is one of those things that can cause far more harm than it can produce good. And yet, we have to acknowledge there is significance to certain numbers in Scripture. Seven is shown to be the number of God. Six, Revelation says, is the number of man. And twelve is the number of fullness or completion. We see it most specifically in the twelve tribes of Israel and the twelve apostles chosen by Jesus. So for 12,000 servants to be sealed from each of the 12 tribes of Israel, it's not literally 144,000 people, but it signifies the complete salvation of Israel. Mm. We even saw Jesus do this when Peter came and said, it said, Master, how many times should I forgive my brother? Seven times? And Jesus said, not seven, 70 times seven. So was Jesus saying 490 is the limit? Or was he making us realize something? Mm. You just keep doing it. Because the number of God, 70 times 7. So you forgive one another even as God has forgiven you in Christ Jesus. That's what Paul would write later. Paul was fulfilling what Jesus started. Jesus, Jesus told us a figurative story, and then Paul gave us an actual answer. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we're seeing here. It's not that there will be 144,000 witnesses. It is that Israel will be completed. Just as a reference for the number's significance, we see it used elsewhere in, in the book of Revelation. In Revelation 21, 16, the New Jerusalem is 12,000 stadia, which is an ancient uh, measurement. 12,000 stadia long, 12,000 stadia wide, and 12,000 stadia tall. What does that mean? The New Jerusalem is complete. The New Jerusalem will be perfect. It will be as it is meant to be. The number is not literal. It, it has to be understood um, as having significance, but not being a literal number. The most significant part of this for me is not the number, but the actual people. It's that all the believers are said to be from Israel. They are Jewish believers chosen not just to be followers of Jesus, but servants, even witnesses for God. These 144,000 are talked about further in Revelation. We're told in Revelation 14, 1, and they're spoken of often in chapter 14, but especially in chapter 14, verse 1, it says that the 144,000 witnesses are present with Jesus on Mount Zion when he returns. So for tonight, what I want us to see is that this passage reveals the fulfillment of God's promise mm -hmm. spoken through Paul in Romans 11, 25 and 26. Because this is the thing. For every prophecy given in Scripture, there is a fulfillment given in Scripture. 
so many of us think that we're waiting for things to happen. And we are in the physical, but the scriptures have already revealed those things to us. That's why revelation was given, so that the scripture would not close without the promises being fulfilled. So that we could see, even though they're still coming, they've already been promised, they're already going to be. And so we can go back to the prophets and we can see in Revelation, that's where the promise is fulfilled. And we can see throughout the Gospels, this is where those promises are fulfilled. And so Revelation was written not to give us a treasure map to the end, right. but for us to know God is faithful to yeah. his promises. Yes, yeah. amen. And so Revelation chapter 7, the first eight verses, is the fulfillment of the promise that was given in Romans 11, 25 and 26. Paul says this, I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery. It is a mystery. Understand that. Brothers and sisters, so that you may not become conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of Gentiles has come in. And in this way... All Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will turn godlessness away from Zion. Mm -hmm. So let's take that, not real slowly, because I know we're already up against our usual time, but we're going to go a little longer than usual tonight. Let's take that for what it says. First of all, Paul says, I don't want you to be ignorant of this mystery. That means it's something that we would never understand on our own. And we still don't understand it. If, I, if we'll just be really blunt. I don't understand a lot of what's written here but I think that we, it opens up to us. Why does he want us not to be ignorant? So that you may not become conceited. Ignorance creates pride. A lot of people will tell you that ignorance is bliss. It's not. The bliss is actually the pride of not knowing what you don't know. And so what Paul is saying in this passage is, if you don't understand Israel's role, you will become conceited in thinking you are something that you are not. You will start to forget that you were grafted in. You will start to forget that the gospel is first for the Jew and then for the Greek. You will start to forget that your calling is to provoke Israel to jealousy so that God's people will be merged with the church that we will all be one because Jesus tore down the dividing wall. See, Romans 9 through 11 reveals, and this in verse 25 and 26 is so hard for us to understand, but that Israel's rejection of Jesus was purposed by God and that it is not at all God's rejection of Israel. It can't be fully explained or fully understood, but Paul literally says this, God hardened their hearts in part so that the Gentiles, you and I, could be grafted in. Why? How? What does it mean? It means God is more sovereign than I understand him to be. It means that God is more faithful than I understand him to be. But it means that Israel's rejection of Jesus is not completely because of their wickedness, but that God has a hand, a purpose, a plan in it. They were partially hardened so that you and I could be accepted. But what Paul wants us to understand most of all is that God's covenant with Israel stands. Mm. In fact, Paul used a very key word in Romans eleven twenty six. He says, until. They were hardened in part until the number of Gentiles is completed. Israel's hardened of heart is for our sake. There is a great mystery in this, and the more we try to explain it, probably the less we understand it. But the truth is, Israel is God's chosen people eternally. Mm -hmm. He will not forsake them. There is no new Israel. The church has not replaced Israel. God is faithful to his covenants. And we have to be willing to accept and acknowledge that, because if not, it changes who God is. If God gave the Israel over and just took the church as, an, as, as their replacement then how will we not be replaced? Because we are, with, we are not without spot or blemish. We have rebelled. We have rejected him. We have often found ourselves wearing the filthy rags of our own righteousness. We have often been on the wrong side of God's righteousness. Look at the things the church has done throughout the ages. Look at the way that they've treated others. Look at the, the way they've fed themselves. Look at the, the, way, at the way. There's always a remnant of holiness, but the church has always fallen. If he rejected Israel when they fell, why have we not been rejected? Mm -hmm. He didn't. He doesn't. He can't. It's who he is. He is faithful to his covenants. Mm -hmm. Look what happens. Revelation 7 is the fulfillment of Romans 11. 
When the full number of Gentiles has come in, God will hold back wrath so that Israel can be sealed. Now the question that some ask, and it's, it's worth asking, does Romans 11.26 mean that all Jewish people will be saved simply because they're Jewish? The answer to that biblically has to be no. Because the Bible tells us very clearly in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which men must be saved. There is no way to salvation except through Jesus. But what we see in Revelation 7 is that Jesus makes himself known. He holds back his wrath, and he will seal Israel for himself. Please remember this. When the Bible talks about all, it speaks of the completion of God's purpose. Mm -hmm. when, when the scriptures tell us, when Mark says that all of Capernaum stood outside of Peter's house to get healed by Jesus, do you and I really believe that means every single citizen of Capernaum? It means everyone that the Spirit drew, everyone that God willed for healing, everyone that was being led at that moment and at that time. All is about God's plans. It's not about numbers. Yeah. And so when it says all Israel will be saved, it does not mean every single person of Jewish descent. It means there will be a completed salvation for the nation of Israel. That he chose them as a people and he did not forsake them. Even if we could say they have forsaken him. To ask, does this mean every single Jewish person will be saved? Again, I can't answer that clearly. But I do believe it means that God will complete the work he began in Abraham and that he promised through Paul that Israel would be a blessing and they would be blessed. And that the number of Abraham's children, and remember, what, is this, what does the New Testament teach us? Abraham's children are those who believe in Jesus. They are the Jews who believe in Jesus. They, you know, there's the spiritual Israel that we have, I think, kind of misunderstood and grafted everybody into. And that's not exactly what the scripture is trying to teach us. But it's, Abraham was promised that the number of his descendants, they would be more than the, more than the sand on the seashore. Well... Abraham's descendants, according to Hebrews, are those who walk by faith. Because he's not just the father of Israel, he's the father of faith through righteousness. Israel will not be left out. She will be saved. The last four verses tell us that there are 12,000 children of Israel sealed from each of the 12 tribes. But what has caused some confusion is that the list of the 12 tribes here is different than in other places. Judah comes first. Judah isn't supposed to come first. He was not the oldest. And yet, remember this. Judah went to battle first because the tribe of Judah, the, 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 the singers, went first into battle. Have you ever thought, forgive me, another tangent, but have you ever thought about that reality and how crazy that is? Like, the singers went first. As they went out into battle, those whose job was to sing the goodness of God, those whose job was to declare the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever, they went first. You'd want to go last, maybe in the middle at best. But first, I'm, I, I, I'm not safe. I don't have a weapon to defend myself. I don't have anyone to defend me. Judah went first into battle. Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. There are so many things that we could come up with to figure out why Judah's first, but here's the reality. We would just be coming up with things. And what's happened for us too often is when we come up with things, we create theologies that are far less than the character of God. And see, there are some, and, and maybe you even fall into this, I don't believe this way, but there are some who believe that the reason that the tribe names are different and there are some, some um, discrepancies from the Old Testament list is because this isn't actually Israel. It is to signify that this is all, the, all believers. And so now this is just 144,000 from all the believers. But for me, that doesn't hold scriptural water. And it also doesn't stick with the character of God in this situation. So what do we have in this list? Here are the discrepancies. Dan isn't mentioned. D the tribe of Dan is left out, and the tribe of Ephraim is no longer here because it seems that their name has been changed to their father Joseph. Now, some people believe that Dan is left out because based on Daniel 11.37 and Jeremiah 8.16, they believe that the Antichrist will come from the tribe of Dan. I've read it. I haven't studied it a ton. I've read it enough to know that I just can't grab hold of that. It could be true. I just can't wrap my head or my heart around it yet. But what we do know about Dan is that historically, Dan was the tribe that introduced idolatry to the nation of Israel. 
Do you remember in Genesis chapter 49 when Jacob was on his deathbed and he was prophesying over each one of his sons? Do you remember what his prophecy was for Dan? One of the weirdest and worst prophecies that any of us could have ever heard. Jacob said, Dan will be a snake by the roadside, a viper along the path that bites the horse's heels so that its rider tumbles backward. So what we see is that it seems that God, by his spirit, gave Jacob an understanding of what Dan's outcome would be. That was fulfilled in Judges chapter 18, verse 30, where we see that the people of Dan took idols and they formed their own priests. And yet, we have to go back to the scripture and the character of God. In Ezekiel 48, in what is considered to be a description of the millennial reign of Christ, Dan is present and listed as having a division of land restored to it in Israel. Why isn't Dan here? I don't know. Ephraim, it was a tribe that was spoken of in Hosea 4.17 as being joined to idols. Maybe that has something to do with it. Maybe Joseph's name just takes the place of it. We don't know. But in all, I think it's important not to make much of the tribes being listed in a different order or even with tribes being omitted or renamed. Because if you go through the lists of how many times the tribes are listed in the, in the Old Testament, there are at least 20 different ways of listing those tribes. And even once, I believe it's Second Chronicles, where Dan is left out. See, we may not know why they are written the way they are, but what we can see if we will choose to look is that Revelation 7 reveals the fulfillment of the promise given in Romans 11. God's judgment is tied to his redemption because it all comes from his character. We literally have no need to fear anything that is in his hands because he does all things well and he is both just and holy in all things. That means that nothing is ever to be feared because there is nothing he does not have authority over. That does not mean all things will be pleasant, doesn't mean all things will be easy, or even that everything is going to turn out okay. But it does mean that he can be trusted. And even though it is promised, in this world you will have trouble, we can and we we must choose courage because if we choose courage we will remember that he has overcome the world and in him we have and we will never lose our peace as long as we live in courage God's promises are true because his character is just and so as we continue to move through revelation here's what I want us to do look for fulfilled promises don't just look for the next thing to happen Look for the last thing to be fulfilled. Because everything about Revelation is the fulfillment of God's promises. Because everything about Revelation is revealing the character of God to us so that we'll live in that place. Last thing and we'll wrap up. If the wrath of God is in God's hands and it's only given by God's authority, and if we know that God is good, we have no reason to fear his wrath. There is nothing in life that comes that God is not in the middle of. That's what it means for him to be sovereign. It doesn't mean he does it all to us. It means he's with it, us in it all. And so what I would challenge you today in this uncertain time, in this uncertain season that we find our, ourselves in, where it seems like one thing is building upon another and another, fear not. And instead of spending your effort trying to figure out what the world is doing, what Satan's doing, forgive me, what the Democrats are doing, what the Republicans are doing, what Black Lives Matters is doing, what the police are doing, instead of trying to figure out what all of these factions are doing, start asking God, what are you doing? Because here's the truth that I know. God is actively working in Black Lives Matters, mm -hmm. and he's actively working in police departments. Mm -hmm. God is actively working among Republicans, and he's actively working among Democrats. God is actively working in this world, and in my city, and in your city. God is actively working. Why? Because Jesus made this promise. My Father is always at work, and I too am working. And God never fails at anything he works at. Remember what he told us? His will comes to pass. He taught us that none of his words fall to the ground, that everything that he desires is, it comes, is fulfilled. So rather than being afraid of what we see happening, rather than trying to figure out what's going on, let's just spend our effort telling the truth and seeking his face. 
See, there, we are in a season that should be exciting to us rather than fearful. Because here's where we are. We have more open ears and more open hearts. And we have more opportunities to witness and to intercede than ever before. If you don't know what to intercede for, send me a message and I will tell you. I can, I can point you to the things that I see happening, to the things scripture show are happening, to the things that God is doing. And this is our time to pray. And so I encourage you today, don't worry, pray. Don't get, let yourself join the anxious conversations. Join the faithful intercession. Don't let yourself be overtaken because Jesus has already overcome all of this. Doesn't mean it won't touch you. Doesn't mean it won't affect you. Doesn't mean it will not even harm you. It means God will use it for good. Because that's what he does. And we know this. Yeah. All things work together for good. If the promise of Paul in Romans 11 can come to pass in Revelation 7, how many promises are being fulfilled in our community right now? And how many promises could be fulfilled if God's people would join God's work in the middle of a difficult season. Mm. We're here for his glory, and his glory leads to redemption. Mm. So next Wednesday night, we'll meet together for Zoom discussion at 7 o'clock. If we don't have your email address and you want to be a part of that discussion, please just send us a message or leave it in the comments if you're comfortable with that, and we'll make sure you get that, um, we'll make sure that you, you get that invitation. It'll probably come next Wednesday or in the early part of the day. In two weeks, we'll move deeper into Revelation 7, and we'll see the multitude from every nation that comes out of the tribulation. And this should be exciting to us. Like, the, the next stage is that John sees more people than can be counted. And that who are they, he's asked. And the answer is, these are the saints who came out of the tribulation. Not the ones who were lifted out. The ones who were purchased in, in the middle of it. Now, let me just address this last thing before we close. Governor Murphy has reduced gathering restrictions, meaning people, churches can now start to meet as long as they um, are fewer than 50 people or fewer than 20, less than 25% of their capacity, whichever is smaller. You guys that come here, you know we have a small space. So we are going to have to take our time because by meeting here, um, we can't safely distance and still have our regular group of people. So my hope is that we will slowly move into meeting together, but we are going to continue live streaming no matter what happens. Um, I don't know exactly how we'll configure things, but I know there are some of you that have started joining us from outside of our community. I don't want you to be left out. Um, I don't want to lose that fellowship and that, that communication that we have with each other. Um, and so what we may have to do is start with a few people and live stream and maybe, you know, trade in and out. One, one week this group comes and the next week the next comes. We're working on those plans now, but my, my, the, the, the request that I have is just be patient with us. Um, we want to be wise. We want to be obedient um, to the, our leaders, and we also want to be careful with each other. Um, really important to me that we think more highly of ourselves than we think uh, than we think more highly of others than we think of ourselves. Um, and so, while I know that we are eager to be together in in, in physical form, um, we want to do it with wisdom. Uh, we want to do it with kindness, and we want to do it by the Lord's leading. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, I'm going to close our time in prayer um, and then look forward to seeing you again soon. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word, but so much more, thank you for your character. Thank you that our calamities do not change your character. Thank you that you don't lash out. Thank you that you don't react. Thank you that you simply are faithful to who you are and you do everything you say you're going to do. Father, I thank you tonight that all Israel will be saved. And the reason I thank you for that, first of all, is because we should desire for all to be saved. But secondly, if that promise can come to pass, it means that promises that I have, that all of my household will come to pass, that will, will come to salvation, will come to pass. That people that I'm praying for, that I'm believing for you to move on their hearts, it means I can trust you to bring them to salvation. 
And so, God, I pray that you would stir our hearts, and I pray that the promise fulfilled in Revelation 7 would stoke our hearts of intercession. And I even pray tonight, God, for those that are watching, may they start lifting up the names of people that they're waiting to see saved. May they not get weary in well-doing. May they not get discouraged, but may they seek your face, and maybe they call out those names in your presence. Lord, woo them to yourself. God, I pray tonight for Christopher and Ashley, and I pray, God, that you would heal the wounds of their hearts and turn their necks back to you and break through the hard places, win them to salvation in the same manner that you hold back wrath for Israel, hold it back for them. Bring them to salvation. Father, give us a belief that you want to save and give us a longing to join you in the work of salvation. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. And may we do it by number one, praying for salvation, but then also by sharing the gospel. Make us a people who join you in the things that matter to you that none would perish, but that all would come to repentance. Keep us, give us wisdom, give us direction. May we choose courage, and may we rest in your peace. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. God bless you guys. Thank you for joining us. Again, um, we'd love to have you join us Sunday morning at 10 o'clock here on Facebook Live. Um, Next week, we will be here on Wednesday night. We'll be on Zoom on Wednesday night. Also, the last thing, for those that are in our community, um, we have joined with um, a couple of organizations as well as the police department, and we will be helping to lead a unity and peace rally tomorrow night here in Burlington City. That's at 6 o'clock on the steps of the municipal building on High Street. Would love to have you come out and join us. Would love to have you praying for us, um, that our community in the middle of turmoil um, would not just seek peace, but would choose peace. So thank you so much. God bless you and look forward to seeing you soon.